Hi, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle Pelazon, your host and the head witch in charge here at Holisticism. And today we're talking about SEO, search engine optimization. <laughs> the working title for this episode is SEO for Babies because... I was writing title ideas. I was writing content ideas and SEO for babies came out as a rough draft for ideas when I was pitching ideas for myself and it just kind of stuck and we've been using it since and we've been using babies as a stand in for beginners <laughs> um, because if you can explain it to a baby, then like, you know, you're then it's going to be really clear, right? You got to be simple and direct and no like fancy jargon. So um, I have no idea if we're going to change the name of this of this episode from SEO for Babies, but the working title is SEO for Babies. And I'm really excited about it because I love SEO. I actually think it's way more intuitive and way more creative than most people peg it out to be. The people that I see teaching SEO online are usually like mm, dudes, dude bros who like are all about I don't know. What do we used to call them? Like growth hackers. Like they're growth hackers who are trying to get lots of thousands of views on your website. And while that's totally useful to like an e-commerce business or I don't know, to like a content media site where you're making a ton of money off of ads, for the average person who has an online business or who has a partially online, partially offline business, a brick and mortar that also has an online website. SEO is not that deep. Like it's not that complicated. It's pretty, honestly, pretty simple when you understand how it works. And it's also way more intuitive, like I said, and way more creative than most people are pegging it out to be. So when you understand the basic tenets of SEO, you kind of get it. And like, I don't think I'm going to convince anyone from this episode to like double down on SEO and only focus on SEO on, on, for their website because To me, that's kind of not the function. SEO is important. It's an an important thing to understand and to just kind of have in your back pocket. It's kind of like a tool that you want to know how it works so that if you want to add more energy to it, it can get you more results if you want. But I find that most people relate to SEO or I'll speak from the eye. My experience of my students and people who ask me about SEO is a lot of fear. Like, oh my God, it's so complicated. And I'm just so far behind already because I have an SEO at my site and it's going to be impossible for me to do it. So I'm just not going to do it. And I'm here to tell you that it's first off, not impossible. You don't have to be an expert in order to SEO your site. And it's a lot easier. Like you can make it as complex as you want it to be. If I was just getting started, I would start with like three keywords and try to start ranking for those keywords. If I really wanted to double down on SEO, I would make all my content around SEO. But anyways, we talk about this in the episode, which is all it's all to say that, like, I think you should stick around if you are a maker, if you have an online business, if you are a content creator. Or if you're someone who has a local business that has a brick and mortar space, SEO can be really helpful for that. And Maybe you're none of those things, but you just kind of want to understand how this works. Perhaps you're an independent contractor who does content or who does content strategy. SEO is important to understand and kind of know so you can orient and pitch the right content to your clients that really helps them get seen and get seen by the right people. And again, it's more of truly understanding the concept than There's all these bells and whistles that you can apply to SEO, but when you understand how it works, it makes it so much easier. Again, concepts over hacks. Those are always going to be better. So that's what we're talking about today. It's going to be so good. I am so chipper right now. I was exhausted. Like mm, a mere 15 minutes ago, I had like seven hours of meetings today, which is way too much. That's like six hours too many for me as a projector and an introvert. But my calendar has just been packed over the last couple of weeks. So I typically, when I have really long days like this, I need like a full day to recharge the day after two, two days. So I block my time out on my calendar. I'm absolutely ruthless. I don't give anyone access to me, but I just got amped up. And I think it's because I put on makeup. That's my new thing. I've gotten a couple messages. This sounds so douchey, but I've actually gotten quite a few messages from all of you who listen about mentioning that I've I've mentioned depression and that I have depression on this podcast and I didn't even recognize it I guess because I it's so normal for me to talk about with my friends and with my partner but I forget that like that's still kind of a taboo thing I guess or it's hard to talk about like people have a perception of you if you have depression I don't know I think I've always had it so (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm just like this. And I've gotten a bunch of just questions with people who are more curious to know, like how I personally deal with depression and oh, what do I do to manage it? And like, how can you be a happy person and also have depression? And let me just tell you, we are complex creatures. So I don't think that like I should do a full podcast episode on that unless you really want it. So if you really want it, just like write in and let me know. You can text me at the number in our in our show notes or just send me a DM at Holisticism on IG. But something that I've been doing lately, because for me, depression is just like, that's why I'm into wellness and well-being, I think, other than my epilepsy. I kind of have a lot of problems. <laughs> the reason I got into wellness is because, like, I have all these things to manage, right? Like, if I don't take care of my body, I have seizures and then I'll die. So that's not ideal. And also, if I don't take care of my, like, spiritual and mental and physical health, then depression comes a knocking. And <laughs> so I kind of need to, like, manage it in order to, like, exist in the world <laughs> and do things and, like, live my purpose. I feel so that means that like my routine and like how I quote unquote like cope with depression is uh, constantly ebbing and evolving and changing and flowing and like mm, it is not static that's for sure because it's kind of like shampoo when you use the same shampoo over and over again your hair like stops responding or skincare I guess I feel like it's the same with like depression or anxiety because I've had both and it's kind of like it gets smart it gets wise to like your tricks <laughs> how you're keeping it at bay so for anyone else there out there who maybe has some bluesiness has depression <laughs> who i hate when people say battle depression i'm like depression is not knocking down my door with a flamethrower depression's like crawling sliming into bed with me and it's just like yeah how about we just don't get up you know because the world <laughs> it's not like some dragon to be slayed. <laughs> it is much more insidious than that to me. But anyone else who maybe has depression, something that I've, that's really been helping me lately is makeup. I know it sounds so cheesy, but I was never really a makeup person growing up. And I think there's like some internalized misogyny there around wanting to be taken seriously and wanting to be smart instead of like pretty or womanly because I, I didn't really have those things. So I could be smart for, you know, I felt like I only people would only pay attention to me for one reason. So the reason I picked was being intelligent. So I always like played down. I didn't wear makeup really. And yeah, I guess there are a lot of reasons. I was also an act, very active person. So sweating a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I just never really got into makeup and even though I, I love when other people wear it, I'm always in awe. And I think I'm also super self-conscious. I, in fact, I know I'm super self-conscious when I'm wearing makeup. I'm always worried it's all over my face. So this pandemic has been a real shit show. But one of the bright sides is that I, I personally started playing with makeup because I was at home. So I could wear like red lipstick and not be embarrassed if it got on my teeth. Because guess what? There's no one here other than the people on Zoom. And Zoom kind of like filters that out. So you can just show up however you want. You still look pretty good, even if your makeup's a little bit messed up. And it's been so fun for me to, you know, to put on makeup in the morning. It's like kind of like my, I guess, I don't know battle gear <laughs> war paint it's really nice i like it i'm enjoying it i'm also following donnie davy on instagram and she's the makeup artist for euphoria the hbo show and i didn't watch the show so sorry but i have been following her she popped up on my for you page and i just love how she does makeup it's so inspiring to me and so creative and it feels like your face is this like totally a palette to like make art and I love to paint and do watercolor so I'm an amateur artist but I've been just trying to experiment with like well what would I do on a piece of paper what if I did that to my eyes <laughs> and it's been so fun so I think that's why I'm chipper I just I just opened up a makeup palette and put some wild colors on my eyes and I'm really enjoying it. So better than coffee, which pff, I had to quit. Anyways, I'm digressing. I'm really excited about today's episode. Oh, I'm also so excited because today's Friday and that means that our issue of the cusp is 
out. The Cusp is our secret VIP newsletter and community for people who are interested in exploring conscious consumption in the wellness space. And so every month we put out product reviews and we talk to experts who have mm, gauged those products and tell us whether they're legit or they're just passing trends that we should really ignore. We publish job listings from the best jobs in the wellness space. So if you're looking to get hired, then go to the cusp because we're going to hit you up with the best stuff that comes our way and a lot of stuff that doesn't make it onto job boards because we're connected. And finally, every month we also publish a research report. And this month's research report is so good. It is on fitness and hardware and software in the fitness space and at-home fitness. And basically, we're looking at everything that's sprung up in the last year, how this industry has developed and changed and evolved over the last 12 months. There's been a massive amount of VC investment in hardware products and at-home sort of like deliverables for people to work out. There's also obviously so many streaming platforms that exist, but really the people who are at the forefront of this industry are the ones who are focusing on hardware and proprietary software. So there are some really good examples inside of this research report of companies you should be watching. If you're in this space, if you are a trainer or you work in fitness, I think you're really going to want to check this out. We also have a bunch of recommendations and potential business ideas for people who already work and operate in this space. I'm particularly excited and interested to see how this model of wellness and fitness instructor as talent really comes into play. Peloton has been the master of this. I would say that SoulCycle really kind of like originated this idea of the celebrity sort of trainer or the like talent, right? They treated their spin instructors as like rock stars. And Peloton took note from that, right? Because the instructors were a key component to SoulCycle's success and to SoulCycle just blowing up. And when SoulCycle started to falter was when they stopped having that, you know, sort of celebrity-like talent that would be leading these classes. So many SoulCycle instructors were actors and dancers and people who were in like the performing arts or who were in the industry. So it's very interesting to watch how the evolution of so many creatives, so many just like charismatic people have moved into the fitness and wellness space when they maybe haven't found success or fame in film and television or in theater or whatever it is that they maybe initially set out to do. And that's really behooved the fitness space. And Peloton in particular has really taken this to heart. We talk about Peloton in this research report. Again, super recommend that you read it. It's a very long but really detailed research report. It's fun. Trust me, it's not boring. But we're going to see something really interesting. The trend here is for these online fitness companies to effectively acquire talent, meaning they take a celebrity instructor who maybe is out on their own and they pull them under the umbrella of Peloton or another company that we looked at, which is called Open, which is a meditation and breathwork platform that's incredible. But they have sort of copied this Peloton model of absorbing talent into their orbit. And I think that there's a huge opportunity here. And I talk a lot more about it in this research report, by the way, I wrote the research report for people who are fitness and wellness instructors to effectively be acquired, right? For their intellectual property to be acquired by these bigger brands and businesses. And I think there's also a huge opportunity for them to have representation, just like talent does, talent agencies do. Of course, people like WME and the other talent agencies that exist out there, CSA, have arms, you know, sort of for the fitness and wellness space. But I think that agencies that only solely focus on the talent of fitness and wellness influencers and instructors, more educators than influencers, is going to be a huge opportunity. We just look at Peloton's market share. It's billions of dollars. There's like so much at stake here. And all of this is important to understand because it affects and impacts how the wellness space works, right? And how we operate as consumers or as facilitators or practitioners in this space that's becoming commodified and commoditized in a very interesting way. So if you work in wellness and well-being, if you just want to have your finger on the pulse of the trends that are happening in this space, and you want more of like an inside look on what's going on in the industry, what's going on behind closed doors, what's happening, you know, financially, then 
I really recommend checking out the cusp. The first two weeks are free. It's five ninety nine a month. We actually I think I said it was six ninety nine last time I came on this podcast and it's not. It's five ninety nine. I totally messed that up. Which is so affordable. Five ninety nine a month. That's like one and a half kombuchas. And you get so much value. You get job listings, you get discounts to products that we love, you get these insider research reports. And by the way, you also get connected with a super cool group of people. Ah, we've actually had so many of your favorite founders for products that you love join the cusp over like the last two weeks. So you can actually pop in there. It's very hype beasty and cool. And tell your favorite makers, you know, the founder of Wooden Spoon Herbs, Lauren, you can tell her what you want to see in her range. You can tell, oh God, there's so many great people. So it's just a really cool space. It's really, if you want to be in the know about what's going on in the wellness and well-being world, and you also want to have real authentic conversations around what it looks like to consume and be a responsible, conscious buyer, right? like participant in this world, then I think you're going to feel right at home on the cusp. You can join at the link below. The first two weeks are free. And if you don't love it, it's totally fine. You can just cancel. But we'd love to have you in there. It's super, super fun. And there's lots of goodies and treats and delightful things that are to come. Okay, so that's it. Oh my gosh, what a long intro. Sorry about that. I just, again, it was the makeup. I think I just got excited. I I can't blame it on coffee. Can't blame it. can't blame it really on anything, but I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode on SEO. I can't wait to hear what you think, and I hope it demystifies some of the strange and unusual aspects of SEO that maybe have scared you, and I can't wait to hear how you use it and start thinking about it in your business. Ah, and as always, we have an amazing free download for the content creation station. You can grab that at the link here in our show notes. And the content creation station is so fucking cool. It took a very long time for us to build, but I think that it's honestly what I wish I'd had when I started making content. And it's inspired by my years and years and years of working in the content space. We give you content ideas. We give you an editorial calendar template. We give you exercises for how to create and generate content using mysticism like the tarot and astrology and the Akashic Records. And we also give you editing tips. It is really like an all-in-one package and you can get it for free. I even include a video walkthrough to show you how to use it. So if you're someone who's making content for your business, either free content to get more people to join your email list or to get more followers on Instagram, or you're making paid content because you have a course or a membership or products that you want people to buy, I think that this content creation station will be super valuable for you. It is a Notion template that you can just duplicate and add to your flow. So you can grab it at the link below, or you can go to holisticism.com backslash content creation. I think that's it. Content dash creation. Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's all I have for you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Bye. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast. It's me, Thais, she, her king, and I've got Michelle and Wallace, and today we're going to be talking about SEO, and I'm going to keep it real. I don't know anything about SEO, so I'm really happy we have Michelle, who knows some things about it, and Wallace, who will offer her input as well. So let's do this. Let's get famous on the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's the subtitle of this podcast episode for sure. <laughs> let's get Google. People often are like, no, 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 explain it to me like I'm four. And I'm like, well, how about I just explain it to you like you're, you're a baby? Because like that's, you don't need to be like super smart <laughs> in order to understand SEO. It's actually not really that complicated. There's just like a bunch of nerdy tech guys talking about SEO who like totally represent like patriarchy and intimidating people with like fancy technical terms. And you don't need to be a tech nerd in order to understand it and to use it. So SEO for babies. Here we go. Here we go. So what do you guys know about SEO? Well, from what I think about SEO, it's the reason why someone's website comes up first. I'm like, all right, they did something with SEO. And that's as far as it goes for me. That's a great understanding. (laughs) (laughs) Can't wait until there is another search engine that is not Google because it will be soon, I think. Do y'all remember Bing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that yeah. Google's competitor? I mean, I would put competitor yeah, in, like, Yahoo? very soft, soft, like, quotes, like, air quotes. Like, Bing tried to come in, and no one took it. No one took the bait. 
No. Yahoo no. search. There's a yeah. couple. I mean, like, if you think about where where and how we search things, search, like, the idea of a search engine is actually, I think, becoming more diversified because we don't just type into Google mm-hmm. anymore when we're searching a person. We type into Instagram. We type into right. Spotify. We type into Apple Podcasts. We type into Pinterest. Pinterest is one of the biggest search engines out there, and it's a visual search engine. We type into Amazon, right? If like I've totally searched for things on Amazon before, from books to actual physical products to skincare, right? So there are different search engines that we're using, but the biggest search engine that we use on a day-to-day basis is Google, and Google is also typically connected to all those other search engines. So you you can think about it as like the one search engine to rule them all. It's connected to all these other places. It's pulling in content from all these other other websites and web apps. And SEO stands for search engine optimization. It's a verb. It's also a noun. I I learned about SEO when I was working at a glorified grocery store online. And we wanted to come up in Google search when people typed in something like paleo tortilla chips. And so in order to come up when people type that in, we wanted to make a product description page. So a page that like Let's say when you type something into Amazon, what that product looks like, that's a PDP, product description page. And we needed to make that page be really robust and have a lot of content, have a lot of keywords so that it Google weighed it more heavily than other product pages that were on the Internet for paleo tortilla chips. So I started learning about SEO in terms of content and in terms of e-commerce when I worked at the startup. And it was super fun and I loved it and it was so nerdy and it's definitely helped me build holisticism, but also help other brands and companies build their presence online. And while I think that SEO is really important to understand, I don't think it's make or break for your business. So I don't think that you absolutely, especially as a small business owner, I don't think you absolutely need to like nail SEO in order to be super successful. But it's something nice to know and to have in your back pocket and to just be an awareness of because you can make it work for you. There are always going to be more like SEO tips and tricks that you can add on to into your arsenal. But once you understand the basics of how it works and just like kind of the theory around it, you can begin to optimize your website and the content that you're making in order to get more people on your content to get in front of a bigger community of people. Did I miss anything while I was explaining that, guys? No, but something that I would also like to add is if you do become like number one in your SEO or you do all the work so that you're being found, make sure that your business or your entity is postured to be able to handle all the traffic that comes. (laughs) Because I think sometimes we're like, I want to I want to be the one that they see. But then when all the things start coming, can you like sustain it? Yes. Yeah, that's a really great point, Thais. And this is why SEO, just for the sake of SEO, is kind of pointless. So whenever we're thinking about getting, I think we've we've said this a couple of times, like throughout the podcast, and I know we talk about it in, in Profitable Content Creator Lab and in IWA, but we don't want to just like see growth for the sake of growth, right? We don't just need to like have people on our website, thousands of people on our website. What's the point? right? Like why, to what end? Why are you driving traffic to your site? So understanding like what the point is of why you want more people on your webpage or landing in your online store, or I don't know, like tooling through your Pinterest will help you get really clear on your intentions and use SEO to the best of your capabilities. So if you're an e-commerce store, meaning that you're someone who's selling actual physical products online, or even like digital products, if you're selling something like eBooks, Your goal with SEO is to get as many people on your page as possible who are qualified buyers, who are people who are going to want to search up something like evil eye talisman, right? You you type that into Google with the intention of buying an evil eye talisman on the internet. So if you're the number one person who comes up on Google search on the very first page of Google, that means Hundreds of thousands of people will be seeing your stuff for free. It's basically a free advertisement because you're in the number one slot on Google search algorithm. And your intention is to sell your actual physical products, right? So when people click in, they buy from you. But if you don't have an e-commerce store, if you're a blog or you're a content creator, then your goal is to convert people to your email list. 
right? Most of the time, if we have blog or like any sort of content site, because there's two ways that we're making revenue. We're either selling our content, we're selling our digital content in the form of courses, memberships, eBooks, stuff like that. And so we usually warm people up by getting them on our email list. So your goal, if you have a blog, is to have lead magnets or content upgrades inside of your content to get people to add themselves to your email list. Or your goal is to get as many people on your website as possible because you're getting money through sponsorships and through advertisements that are on on your web page. I would say that's much more rare these days that people are making a significant amount of money through things like affiliate links for Amazon or for products that they like or even like ads that are on the sidebar of their website just because we don't get the same traffic to blogs that we used to in the early aughts. So for many of the people I think listening to this podcast, you probably fall into the first category of wanting to grow your email list. And so SEO is going to be the most useful for you because you are going to be capturing people who are searching a specific idea or set of keywords, your blog post or your website's going to pop up. They're going to land on your content. It's going to be fucking killer content. And because they like it so much, because it's so useful to them, they're going to add themselves to your email list. So nice. Thanks for mentioning that. The search intent is really important. And that's actually typically where we start. But before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit about why SEO is such a big deal. I have another question. I feel like I'm in school, but, you know, <laughs> the thing about the affiliate link and blogs, you say it's because not a lot of people are going to blogs anymore, but does it have anything to do with, like, the rise in social media as well? And yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%, because we really have, have created micro blogs on things like Instagram and TikTok and, and even Facebook. I'd say Facebook is, like, a bit older and dated and is definitely falling out of style, but... We see sponsorships, we see ads, because we just see more people migrating over to platforms like Instagram and TikTok, as opposed to spending time on actual web pages on blogs. In fact, we see more people on making podcasts than we do making blogs and making paid content on podcasts, making things like ads and, you know, mentioning their affiliate codes. Yeah. So something that I'm thinking would be super helpful is like when people are thinking about SEO, thinking about who their audience is and where do those people live and so like mm -hmm. what's the best way to hit because can you do SEO for on social media? Yeah, kind of. So Instagram is not as like strong necessarily of an SEO. Let's say someone were to type in your name, Thais. Like your Instagram would probably come up as one of the search results on that Google page. And this is why, okay, so let me go back. If they were going to type in your name, Thais, you would come up. But like, let's say you want to be known for something else, like community builder or like, what do you want to be known for, Thais? King, being a king. Okay, great. So let's say you wanted to come up for being a king. That means that you'd have to have that search term or that keyword inside of your social media handle or inside of like your description, your profile, in order to come up for that or to even begin to be, be recognized for that on Google in terms of SEO. And so every time I talk about SEO, I'm referencing Google's search engine. That's what SEO relates to. If we say search results, that means that like search results within another platform. But SEO is specifically confined to Google. So if, if you want to, uh, to be ranking for king, the word king, which is a pretty difficult word to rank for because a lot of content is made around the word king. A lot of people have used <laughs> the word king. But if you wanted to use that and that to come up, if you wanted your name to come up on the first page of Google when people search king, then you definitely want to include that in your social media profiles. But you'd also want to create a ton of content around that keyword or that search term. Does that make sense? Yes. And also it's important to be specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's something for the listeners to know. Be specific. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, okay, well, we're going to talk about search intent. We're going to talk about keywords. We're going to talk about keyword chains in a second, but let's talk about just SEO and why it's a big deal. So, 
Google obviously is a big deal because it's the biggest search engine in the world. And it's despite the fact that we mentioned, you know, Pinterest and Amazon and Instagram and all these other places that we search for things, that search results come up, Google's still most of the time where people are going to go, where they're going to go and type in something in. Most people are not using Bing, sadly, and most people are also not using Yahoo search. So basically, yeah, RAP. Search is how Google makes money. I mean, it's how it, it originally made money, right? And now Google is like this giant thing. It's the alf- alphabet company. But when you think about, I, so I'm recognizing how weird this is as I'm saying it out loud. But when I think about Google, I think of it as a person almost or like it has a motive. <laughs> Google wants to be the number one search place in the world. So, so put yourself in Google's shoes. If you want to be the best search in, in, engine in the world, what do you need to do? You need to deliver awesome content to the people that are using your search engine. So if I type in bologna sandwich, right, Google's want to going to want to make sure that it understands what my search intent is so that it delivers the right information to me when it comes to what I'm searching for. So maybe Google's like, well, does she want to learn how to make a bologna sandwich? Does she want to know what's in a bologna sandwich? Does she want to see pictures of bologna sandwiches? Does she want to see videos of people eating bologna sandwiches? Does she want to know how to spell the word bologna, right? So what Google is trying to do, and it's so wrote Google's algorithm is so intelligent and so robust because there are people working on it every day, all day long, making it better and better and better. But what Google is trying to do is refine that algorithm so that when you type something in, you get exactly what you want. Because if I get exactly what I'm searching for on the first try, then I'm going to keep using Google's search, right? I'm going to keep going back to Google every time I need something as opposed to, I don't know, typing it into YouTube or typing it into Instagram. And when I do that, that increases revenue for Google because Google uses something called Google AdWords. And Google AdWords is where brands and companies and websites Mm. will put money to be at the very top of Google's search page. So they'll pay money to be the number one thing that pops up when people search a term. And so Google knows that the more people that are using Google, the more money they can make from ad and search terms. And so the better that they are, the more advertisers are going to want to use them. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Is that what cookies are? Not kind of. Cookies are a little bit different. Cookies... I don't, I don't know if I can like get into specifics here just cause I'm not as well versed on cookies, but cookies are, I think, more tracking like what happens on your computer and what you're searching. And that can definitely contribute to like your search. So Google will tailor its results. I feel like cookies add a little digital sticker to you. So if you accept cookies on a site, it allows them to track your other activity so that advertisers on their site can market to you more based on your actual search habits and what you're into and what you would buy. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing happens with Google because we all kind of have our unique algorithm, especially if you have your cookies turned on and you're not searching an incognito browser. Which is a great way to avoid a paywall if you need to open up an incognito browser. Oh, yeah, totally. New York yeah. Times cooking session. Like I only live, I live in the incognito <laughs> session for that. <laughs> but, but if you were searching, like, let's say you're going to search your, we're getting a little in the weeds, but I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back. Don't worry. So let's say you were going to search your own name, right? On Google. If you'd keep doing that on your own, <laughs> on your own browser inside of Google, eventually like you're going to be the number one choice because you're going to keep clicking on your website or like, you know, the, the website you like associated with your name. But not everyone in the world is going to, when they type in, let's say Thais Francis, they're going to see. Wait, Thais. don't tell them to Google me. <laughs> 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 so, okay, Michelle Palazon. When I, when they type in Michelle Palazon, they're not all going to see michellepalazon.com. They're going to see lots of different web pages that are ranking we, that have my name in them. And honestly, probably what they're going to see are the websites that are the most powerful, the biggest, have the best sort of like ranking on the internet that I've written web articles for because those websites kind of have like the most weight to them and Google trusts them the most. So we'll go back about to Google's trust and all that good stuff in a second. But 
that's why Google search is so interesting and why if we personify Google, right, of like what is Google getting out of SEO, SEO and having a really strong algorithm that delivers what people want to them makes Google more money. So if you think about it in that way, Google is going to prioritize the best content that it sees according to search intent. So a good rule of thumb in general is the better your content is, the more robust it is, the more valuable it is, the more legit it is, the more that Google is going to rank it higher. And there are a lot of different sort of like things that you can check off your list that we'll talk about in a second. But thinking just as a general rule of thumb, think about making the best possible high quality content that you possibly can. That is one of the best things that you can do in order to start ranking on Google search. Now, Google search, like I said, it's kind of like a person, right? And people have our ulterior motives. And people also are not unbiased. Google is not unbiased. There are a lot of politics around SEO. And there's also like, I don't know, algorithms are very flawed. Algorithms can be racist and sexist and ableist and all of these things, right? They perpetuate how people think and how people act. This could be a whole other conversation, but I really recommend going down this rabbit hole a little bit more if this is interesting to you and checking out two books. The first book is called Everybody Lies, and the very first chapter is about Google search engine. It specifically talks about the 2016 election and how we actually could have predicted that Trump was going to win based on people's racist searches on Google, which is totally fascinating. And the second book is called Algorithms of Oppression. It's written by a PhD in computer, I think in computer science from NYU, which Thais and I went to. And it's much more heady and it's like way harder to get through, but it's super valuable. And both of these books, like the main, the crux of it is at the end of the day, people are programming this search algorithm and people are flawed and people are, can be really problematic. So Google is not exactly fair. It is still biased, and we just need to think about that and consider it when we're using it. I have a question. Yeah. So for the baby who was wondering, like, well, I think my content is great, and I think it's pretty robust. Are there some surefire ways that they can ensure that it's, like, competitive? For instance, not getting a stock photo, but instead, like, you know, what is it that defines, like, really good content? Yeah, great question. So let's think about, there's a couple of things that define great content. The very first thing, and here's the, here's the thing before I like get into this caveat, the reason that I love Google SEO and like, not love, but like the reason I'm, I'm, you I love it. I love it. Fine. I love it. I love it. Like I love, I like love nerding out on it and teaching other people about it because it's really creative, right? There's, it's not math. It's not like one size fits all. There's not a perfect way to do it. It's like a recipe, right? It's like you're cooking and you're adding different ingredients and you're making it taste the way that you want to taste and look the way that you want it to look. And so there's tons of flexibility and creativity within SEO. And yes, there's definitely rules and there's definitely like ideas you should take into consideration and there's definitely structure to it. And that's kind of great. You know, it's nice to have parameters to work within, but at the end of the day, like you get to do this how you want to do it. And I'm going to give you lots of tips and ideas today, but Google's algorithm is constantly changing because it wants to get better and better and better. For example, Google's algorithm is changing in terms of search ideas because people are now using the voice function on like Siri to search for things. So Think about if you were typing in a search term, maybe it's like how to make bolognese, right? You would type that in exactly like that. Or like maybe you would type in bolognese recipe and your search intent, which is a term that we're going to use a lot, but this is where we start whenever we start thinking about content, your search intent, your intention in writing that into Google is to find a bolognese recipe. So maybe you would use the word bolognese recipe or the keyword chain. But if you were going to say that to Siri, how would you say it? How do I make bolognese? Right. Yeah. Or like best bolognese recipe, New York Times. Right. Or like show me the best bolognese from Italy. Right. Like there are so many different things. You would talk in a very different way. And so if we just look at like we isolate the 
keyword phrase that I just said out loud, that's going to be different than someone typing in something into Google, but we have the same intention. We have the same search intent. So because like the number, the percentage of people using voice search is increasing exponentially, that means that Google's algorithm has to change too. So that's all to say that Google's algorithm is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. There's always going to be new tips and tricks that you can apply to your content to make it better. But just like going back to if I can make this as valuable as possible is and walk through these steps that we're going to talk about in a second, you really like can't go wrong. And there's, there's no right way to do it. (laughs) Like there is no perfect way to do it. It's an experiment. And so you get to have fun. Hey, do you have a desire to learn something, but are having trouble keeping yourself accountable? Join one of our co-creation cohort groups currently offering four areas of study, human design, all things astrology, magical practices, and storytelling. The best part? They're totally free. The co-creation cohorts are weekly meeting groups where you'll take turns learning and teaching information. Every group member will volunteer at least once a month to teach the group on anything under the umbrella of their cohort topic. This is the place to do that thing that you've always wanted to do, but needed a little extra support to get you into momentum. For more information, go on over to Holisticism Hub and Mighty Networks, click on cohorts, and explore our co-creation groups. Weekly meetings have already started and are open for access as soon as you're ready to commit. Click the link in our show notes to access our free cohorts. Until then, see you in the Hub. I'm so excited about this. I'm such a nerd. Okay, before I get into that, do you guys have any, any questions about what I just said? I think it's funny when I think about when I voice search something, I always think about how I would type it. Similar to what you were saying, best bolognese recipes, New York Times, or top 10 recipes, et cetera. And I feel like my mind thinks about it. Okay, how would I type this? But now it's going in the other direction. Yeah, it's it. it's kind of like going back to Thais's point about people not using blogs and because they're using social media more, our patterns are changing and evolving. And it's going to be really interesting to see what the tipping point is. And Google is trying to figure that out. So you can do yourself a favor by always thinking about how you can make Google look better. So the first thing that we're going to do is figure out what the search intent is of our users. Because I'm assuming that if you're listening to this, it's because you're going to be using Google search and because you want to make content. So we can make SEO for anything. We can make SEO for a website. But most of the time, what we want to do is rank for a set of keywords or for a key, like an actual keyword. So a keyword chain or just a keyword. The reason that we want to rank for specific keywords is because we want to think about who our ideal client is or who our ideal community member is and what they're searching for online. So in order to do SEO, you got to do an ideal client casting. You have to know who you're talking to. And if you're in PCCL or IWA, you have a tarot spread that walks you through how to cast your ideal client. But if you haven't done this yet, doing an ideal client casting is just sitting down and figuring out who exactly you're talking to. And just because you, you know, do some ideal client work, it doesn't mean that's going to be your only client. It doesn't mean you're going to turn people away that don't perfectly match that ideal client description. It just means you're narrowing in and focusing in on who it is that you are trying to talk to. And the more that we know who we're trying to talk to, the more we can relate to their problems, to their pains, to what they're going through, to their things that they're excited about. And then like the more mundane stuff, like what they're searching for on the internet. So understanding your ideal client is really important before you do any SEO work. If you try to SEO your website before you know who your ideal client is, it's basically just a fool's errand. So I would say if you're getting started, like you're just getting started with your business, don't even worry about SEO. Worry about your ideal client first. 
So if you know your ideal client, then you know kind of like what their problems are, right? And you also probably know what your solution to their problem is, how you're going to help them. That's your value proposition, right? It's what people pay you to do or how you help your ideal client, how you help them transform or help them change their life. So do you guys have an, a good example of like an ideal client or, or like a service that we could be using? As, an, as I feel like it'll help ground this. Maybe like breath work. Oh, yeah. Perfect. And like imagine you're the breath work teacher. Who would your ideal client be? Moms, middle-aged moms who are like trying to figure out the pandemic and their children. Oh, my God. Okay, perfect. That's great. So what do you think a middle-aged mother who is stressed out and trying to homeschool her kids and like losing her mind, what do you think she would be searching in Google that would eventually lead her to – that? Breathwork would be the answer to stress reduction, anxiety management. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I think she'd be looking for like lists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. like something like best ways to beat anxiety right. in five minutes, yeah. or best non-drug <laughs> treatments for anxiety. Yeah, or something for busy moms as opposed mm-hmm. to like a blog post mm-hmm. about how I navigated the pandemic as a middle-aged mother. It's more so like, what are the facts? Like the things? Yes, yes, exactly. Great. Okay. So this is perfect. So oh, I love it. You're excited. <laughs> 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 so this is great. Imagine that we now know who our ideal client is, right? We're putting ourselves in her shoes. And what we just did was exactly what you do in order to figure out SEO content. Because we're like, all right, what the fuck is this person searching for? Because guess what? <laughs> I want to pop up when, they, when they're searching for those terms. And so I'm kind of reverse engineering what someone's problem is or what I think that they'll be like looking for on the internet to be the answer. So I'm going to create content that has to do with those keywords. So let's say Google loves lists, like just in general, Google really loves lists. So if you have a list, like that's a great SEO optimized article because lists also tend to be super long. So let's say that the search term was what that Thais recommended where she said like the 10 best ways for busy moms to de-stress in five minutes, right? So I would first like pop that I search term or that set of keywords into a couple of my different SEO trackers. If you guys go to um, our show notes, I'm putting together an entire like list of everything that we use for SEO. And so I'll put some of my favorite SEO trackers inside of there. But first I would type in that set of keywords and I would see how many people are searching for them. So maybe I type in my list, right? Ways for mom, busy moms to de-stress in five minutes. And I, it's going to pop up with a couple of different ideas or a couple of different metrics. The first metric is going to be how difficult it is to rank for that keyword or that set of keywords. So is it really competitive or a ton of people also trying to rank for that keyword or trying to rank number one on Google for that set of keywords? For example, breath work, just period, that would be a challenging word to rank for because there are a lot of people that want to rank with breath work, right? That want to be associated, that want to be the number one person getting searched for on Google when you type in breath work. It's also pretty vague. So it could be a breath work teacher that's number in the number one spot. It could be the Wikipedia page for breath work. It could be a movie called breath work. It could be a book called breath work, right? It's a vague search term, which means that there's a lot of competition there. So if I'm just getting started, it's going to be a lot harder for me to rank for that term because I don't have a really big website. I don't have a lot of people going to my website. And likely my website hasn't been around for, I don't know, a decade. And all of those things are basically help Google recognize that you're not like a spammer or a bot and that you're legit. So it's kind of like a credit score or like a credit report. When you haven't had credit, a credit card for that long, you don't have a very high credit score, even though you haven't done anything wrong. It's kind of the same thing with Google. If your website's brand new, it's like trying to figure out if you're a robot 
or a hacker in Russia, or if you're like a legit person making content. So what do you do when you first get a credit card in order to increase your credit score? You buy things, right? You use that credit card and you show your credit card company that you pay that that credit card back in good faith every month, either like all the way up or you pay enough down so that they don't have to worry about you defaulting Mm -hmm. on your payments. Google's kind of the same way. So it's going to start ranking you higher and ranking you as more trustworthy as you put more content out more consistently on your website. I feel like also the clearer you are with your ideal client, then you know where that type of person would search. And I think that would help with what you put in for your to make it like funnel it to you. Right. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly right, because when we're thinking about the search intent of our ideal client, We want to put ourselves in their shoes. If a mom is searching for a really quick breath, like really quick five minute anxiety solution, you know what she doesn't want to see? An hour and a half long video about why breath work is so great. She wants a five minute. No, she wants a 30 second video on a breath work practice that she can do right now to help with her anxiety. And so if she lands on my search and she clicks into my piece of content, which is probably a blog post on my website. And she sees that video at the very top. And maybe the title of my blog post is the 30 second breathwork hack that you can do to beat anxiety. Great for busy moms, something like that. And then she ends up like staying on that page and not bouncing off that page, which means that she's going to read the page and she's going to maybe watch the whole video. Google's going to recognize that the person who is searching for that search term got what they wanted when they landed on my website. And that basically gives me points in Google's eyes. Google's like, dope. Great. You're not a scammer. You made some legit content. This is really good stuff. You're making us look good. We're going to keep elevating you because people seem to really like this content that you're making. And that's effectively how we grow through the ranks at Google and how we start to get recognized on the first and second page of Google search for specific keywords. So really understanding who your ideal client is matters, but what matters almost even more than that is putting yourself in their shoes, having empathy for them, and thinking about their search intent when they're typing in a set of keywords. And this is why like intuitive entrepreneurs, people who are already super dialed, are so good at this type of stuff because they kind of are doing it without even... Like I'm, I'm assuming that many of you out there actually are kind of doing this already. You just didn't really put words to it, or maybe you like didn't think about it in terms of Google's algorithm, but you're probably creating content, putting yourself in the shoes of who your ideal client is saying like, well, what would they need in order to, I don't know, like get their problem solved? How yeah. can I help them? Yeah. Cause I was thinking like with this ideal client, for instance, she probably, or they might not want to go on, um, to see a video, they might want something on Pinterest because they already Google like recipes. So it's just like a quick way in. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. And that's where, you know, you asked a question earlier about the robustness of content. Like how can people make really good content that gets picked up on Google that Google like recognizes as quality? And part of it is making your content really readable and easy to for someone when they land on the page to see if they're going to get what they want from it. So how do we make our content more readable, more like easier to understand, easier to sort of like get a bearing of in one fell swoop? Well, we organize it, right? And we have lots of different media inside of it. It's kind of like how we're all different types of learners. Like some people are doing learners, some people are hearing learners. Same thing when you're taking in content. Some people are readers. Some people like to watch videos. Some people like to listen to podcasts like this. And so if we contain multiple types of media inside of a blog post, we have a video, we have some photos, we have a a list, a bulleted list, we have just text. That's going to serve lots of different types of people. There will be some people that read the entire article. There will be some people that just scroll through all of the pictures and click on the pictures. There will be some people that are just looking for that video that's embedded within the site and that's what they watch and that's it. But Having multiple types of media inside of a blog post boosts your SEO. It ranks more highly on SEO because it's, number one, high quality because clearly a lot of thought has been put into it and it's taken you some time to make. 
And because when someone lands on that page, it's a very high likelihood that they're going to get what they want in some form. They might not need all of those types of content, but they probably are going to like at least one of them. So when you're writing an SEO length article or a, an article or a blog post that you want to be ranking for on Google, first know what keyword or keyword terms you want to be ranking for. That's really, really important. Then think about the search intent. So when someone's typing in that keyword, what do you think they'd want to, how, how would they want to get the answer? And then sketch out what the sort of like form of your content's going to look like. So we always include header one, header two, header three, because using headers organizes your content. Another thing that organizes your content is using lists, numbered and bulleted lists. It just makes it easier to read and easier to understand. So use headers and bulleted lists together to help people really quickly understand what's on the page. And I used to be, a, I mean, I still am a copywriter, but I used to be a copywriter and I used to be like a big content pop culture person. And I, when I first started doing SEO, would always get in trouble because I wanted to have like really quippy headlines, you know, like really cute header ones and header twos and header threes that were like, you know, puns or were references to Britney Spears songs. And while that is like really enjoyable to read, it's not that clear. <laughs> so Google doesn't have a sense of humor. I always think of Google as like someone who's kind of like not that fun at parties or is like super literal. And so when Google sees that content, it's not going to like be like, oh, yeah, great reference to Toxic by Britney Spears. It's going to be like, why this doesn't make any sense to me. And it's going to ding you points. So in your headers, your H1s, H2s, H3s, you want to be as clear as possible about what people are, can expect to get in the paragraph that that header goes to. So if you're about to talk about the three ways that breathwork can help you with anxiety in a paragraph, then your header should be the three ways, the top three ways that breathwork can help with anxiety. And then your next header, your header two would be way number one. It helps regulate your hormones or whatever, right? I'm pulling this out of my butt. But you want to be really clear and explicit. Like think about that person at the party who never understands sarcasm, who doesn't really get the joke that you have to just be like really intentional about how you're describing it to them. So you'll use header ones, header twos, header threes. You'll use bulleted lists and numbered lists, and then you'll also intersperse different types of media into your content. So you'll use imagery. Ideally, when you add images into your articles, you want to use the keyword search terms in the titles of those images. So if you wanted, let's say, easy breathwork solutions, maybe that would be your keyword search term. And then you would title your images on the back end as easy breathwork solutions. You want to input video so you can embed video or links even to videos like on YouTube. You can embed things like links to podcasts and podcast players. And that's pretty much it. That's what we're looking at in terms of a really robust piece of content. And the final thing that we're always going to want to want to add in that Google loves are references and to other sites. So inbound and outbound links. Inbound links are just links from your web page, from the page that you're on, to other pages on your site. So if you're writing about breathwork because you're a breathwork teacher, there's probably an article you've written about the origins of breathwork. And you've also probably written an article about, I don't know, like breathwork for stress and anxiety. And you've probably written an article about breathwork for sleep. So in your article about breathwork for busy moms, you're going to want to link to all of those articles as inbound links. And you're going to just reference them inside of that article, right? It's almost like, well, if you want to learn more, like I'm thinking about the search intent of this person, they probably want to learn more about breathwork. So like, let me link to another page on my site that links to, that tells them about the origins of breathwork. You also want to have outbound links. Outbound links are links that link to places like the New York Times or PubMed or other really valuable websites online that are high quality, that are trustworthy as references. So even Wikipedia could be an example as a reference that you'd link out to. And Google likes it when you link out to other pages because it knows that you're trustworthy and that you're like sort of like trying to create content that's 
not just for the sake of getting people on your web page, but you're actually trying to educate people and help people. And you're doing that by giving them the resources and the references that they need in order to like dive deeper. Because remember, Google just wants people to use Google's search algorithm. So if, if you have content that's like really valuable that someone te- learns a lot from, even if it takes them down like a rabbit hole towards a bunch of other amazing pieces of content and other amazing websites, then you're going to use Google search algorithm again. What's important is the actual SEO title and what's going to come up on Google search page. And you can do that inside of Squarespace. It's the second tab when you're writing a blog post. So if you click over to like the SEO, I think it's called the SEO tab, you're going to see a place to write the title of the post and then to write the metadata or the description. And that is really, really important. On a WordPress blog, you can use the Yoast plugin to do this and you're going to need to in order to like to start ranking. And this is very important because this is what Google is pulling from in terms of like what it's tracking for search. So it's also what comes up when you land on the front page of Google or when you land on Google search results. So you want to make sure that the title that you've got is really explicit and clear. If you do something quippy or vague or punny, while that might be cute, (laughs) it's probably not going to perform well on Google search because if I'm searching for something, I want a clear answer. I don't want just like a clickbaity title, right? So I recommend having two titles on your blog posts. I recommend filling out your SEO title, the title that's more clear, more explicit, you know, doesn't really understand irony or sarcasm, and usually has numbers in it. Having a number like Google loves lists. So if you say the five ways to use breathwork to help calm your anxiety, that would be a great SEO title. You also want to have the keyword or the keyword phrase inside of the title especially on your SEO title. So that's going to add, I think of it as like a point system that's going to add more points to your article and Google's going to look at it more favorably. And then inside of your description, you want that to be really clear too. Remember, people are only going to see like two or three lines when they search for whatever the search term is on Google and your results pop up. They see the headline in blue and then they see the URL and then they see the actual like, you know, description of that piece of content. So what are people going to see and what do they need to know or understand is inside your content in order to click on it? So again, most of the time you want to be pretty explicit about what people are going to get out of looking at this article. And that also brings us to your URL. Your URL is pretty important in terms of like nailing for SEO. So you always want to use the keyword inside of the URL. You can change your URL before you hit publish on your blog post. And you can also change the URL on your web pages pretty easily for like, you know, the more static pages that you have on your site. But you want that URL, that slug, which is the last letters or words of the URL. So at Holisticism, it would be, you know, holisticism.com backslash journal or backslash SEO keywords, whatever it is that I'm writing my article about, you want it to depict the keywords that are inside of the article. So if we were writing a story about breathwork for moms, it might be easy, fast breathwork moms. So you don't need to use like is, a, the, all that good stuff. If I were starting from from scratch, I would pick five keywords that I wanted to rank for. I wouldn't try to like pick a jillion keywords. I would pick five. What are the five most important keywords or keyword phrases for me to rank for on my website in order for my users to see me and to like be searching for me and get it, get super stoked when I come up on their search. So that could be totally different for everyone here, but everyone here listening to this, For us, one of the biggest search terms that we rank for is the Akashic Records because I use the Akashic Records. I teach the Akashic Records. I think everyone should be able to open their Akashic Records and I want to demystify them. So that was an important search term for me because we are number two or number three on Google for the term Akashic Records or the search term Akashic Records. We probably get 
anywhere from mm, like five to 10,000 people a month who are searching the term Akashic Records who land on our website. And they land on a very specific piece of content that is an SEO length article about the Akashic Records. So tons of people, maybe even you, if you're out there listening, who search for Akashic Records, find us through searching for that keyword. And then they end up becoming part of our community and students. And yeah, like it's pretty cool. So you don't need to be ranking for every single article that you put on your blog. I think that you really just should focus on ranking for three to five keywords that really matter to you and that are going to be really high quality and deliver high quality potential community members your way. So we know that generally if people are are searching for the Akashic Records, they're probably going to fit in pretty well at Holisticism. So figure out what your keywords are. And in order to do that, understand who your ideal client is and kind of what they're interested in and what they're searching for. Yeah. And also, I want to say, like, everything's not going to be a hit. And so that's a part of it is just like throwing it to the wall. And sometimes process of elimination helps you get even clearer. The thing with SEO is that it's not instant gratification, which is like such a boner killer in this day and age where we want to put something on Instagram or on TikTok and go viral. SEO is the opposite of that. SEO takes like three months to kick in. So you can make the like most baller, amazing article and it might not start really getting traffic for like three months. So SEO is a long game, and that's why I, when people ask about it, I'm not like, oh, my God, you have to drop everything you're doing and do SEO. It's useful. It's really helpful. I'm a, am I happy that we have five to 10,000 people landing on our website every, every month because of an article I wrote like three years ago? Yeah, it's sweet. But would it that make or, make, make or break my business? Definitely not. And it's also something that doesn't require urgency. Like you can build your SEO up over time. So just understanding it and listening to this podcast, you're you're doing a lot of work here. So start thinking about the content that you can be making for people and what you want to be ranking for. And then inside of those three to five sort of keywords that I want to rank for, I would come up with a bunch of articles, a bunch of pitches around content that I'd want to make that could be useful based on the search intent of my users. And then beyond that, I would pick one lead magnet or one content upgrade that could go inside of my SEO article or my SEO piece of content. So I want to have a call to action. I want people to do something, right? Now, if I if I have a content business or a digital business where I'm delivering in digital products, that call to action typically is going to be using a lead magnet or a content upgrade to get people to convert to my email list. If I have a physical product, then the call to action is usually going to be to buy that physical product, right? To buy those paleo tortilla chips, to buy that incense holder, whatever it might be. So we're using, again, content marketing. We're using content as a sort of like almost commercial for what we want people to buy. And so we're delivering value and we're educating people while also mm, using our content as advertising. That's what I would do if I was starting from scratch. I'd just like pick three to five keywords and make really dope content around them and see what lands and keep trying. And the other thing with SEO and just any piece of any content in general is that you have to be consistent. So you've got to make content consistently and it has to be high quality. And when you do, as you make it consistently and as you like get better and better at it, you'll begin to be exponentially rewarded. So it'll be a really slow burn at, bur- at first and it will just suck. I'm just going to say it like it sucks when no one's reading your stuff. It sucks when no one's opening your emails. It's it just sucks. It's not fun. But eventually you like get over this hump of first kind of not caring, <laughs> like just you're making content because you like it and because you know it's helping somebody out there. It's OK that it's not going viral. But also, like, people start to catch on. People start to see you. There's no such thing as an overnight success. Everyone who you see who's got a following, who's got, um, who's got lots of community members, who's, like, blowing up, it's not because they just, like, accidentally did something. It's because they really intentionally 
created a content or created a product or created a business or developed a voice. And so that's what you're doing. And so SEO, to Thais's point, can be this awesome laboratory for you to test and experiment and like fine tune your message and who you're talking to and how you want to say it. What do you think the future of SEO looks like with the changing landscape of people not going to blogs as much, leaning more into audio content or video content? That's a good question. And I am like not a full-time SEO, right? So Uh, there are probably much, there are definitely much smarter people out there who like spend all of their time thinking about Google's algorithm that are more qualified to answer this than I am. But Mm -hmm. something that I'm thinking about and just seeing always on Google's homepage is, or Google search pages is how it's showing me information. So like if you were to search COVID right now, or like if you were to search like plantar fasciitis, I don't want to use something as as charged as COVID plantar fasciitis, like on the right hand side of Google, they pop up with like this Google doctor almost (laughs) that like shows you what plantar fasciitis is. And like, it's Google's own little like blurb that it's, it's, popping up, but it's pulling that information from elsewhere. It's sort of like almost put a mask over it because they want us to know that like we're landing on the right sort of page and then to like get the basic information of like, oh, do I have plantar fasciitis, right? That's kind of like maybe what that search intent is, is do I have this? And then like, what are the solutions? So then Google would like show me the solution probably on that page. So I think it's the same thing with like shopping. I think that Google's shopping algorithm will get better and better because right now it just shows you like examples at the very top and sometimes they're super accurate and other times they're not. I wonder if podcasts are going to start getting populated inside of Google's search as not web pages, but actual podcast episodes that are popping up. Just like sometimes now when you search something like I search stuff for Adobe Photoshop because I never learned Photoshop, but I use it like every single day. So I don't know like anything. (laughs) I don't know the basics of Photoshop. So I search stuff on Photoshop all day long on Google. And it always pops up with like a YouTube video. It's like cut at the perfect spot, like 11 minutes in. And like, that's why we use Google because I know that like, oh, I'm going to get like a 15 second video. I don't have to search through YouTube and like listen to the other 11 minutes. I get exactly what I want. So I think we're going to see more of that. And I think that podcasts will start to get folded into Google search. So I think that they're a really valuable thing to invest in, you know, for the millions and millions and millions of blog posts and blogs that exist out there. There's just a fraction of podcasts like it's still although the market is still saturated and there's still tons of people with podcasts, it's still smaller than the people number of people who have blogs. So it's more that means it's more it's less competitive. So I think that we're going to see that change happen and reflected in Google, just given the big companies like Spotify that are buying up podcast outlets and how much, how many ad dollars are going into podcasts and moving from TV. So I have a lot of, I mean, like clearly I have a lot of opinions about it and lots of thoughts, but I think in general, Google is sort of a beast and in many ways kind of has a monopoly in this space and the same problems. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely the monopoly part of it, because I was sitting here thinking like Google is a beast. But I remembered when we all thought like Facebook was a beast and then it was just like yeah, Instagram was and, a beast, and now it's like TikTok's a beast. But then I'm like, is it possible that Google might be outdated? But I don't think so, because there's only one Google. And Mm -hmm. I was asking that because I'm thinking about the listener, if how can they get ahead? Because I'm thinking like, to me, blogs are becoming a bit more obscure. So if we are thinking like for thinking, like maybe converting blogs to podcasts, like what else are the things to get ahead or to the trends that might be happening that we can use Google for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's definitely to be seen. I would say that I'm so interested in very closely following what's happening with antitrust laws and <laughs> privacy on Google, with Google, with Apple, and with Facebook, because those are the big three, right, that kind of like own our attention. And 
in many ways, they're kind of like evil super corporations, you know, they're like the villains of the story. And they also are the things that our businesses rely on in order to function. And that's why I said, like, you know, it's important to understand how search works and how SEO works, but it's not going to make or break your business. Because as long as you own your audience, as long as you own your community, meaning you have their emails and you can reach them in the way that you want to reach them, then you're going to be okay. Now, is it helpful to have Google on your side, to have Facebook on your side, to have Instagram and TikTok and Apple on your side so you can get in front of more people? For sure. But we need to be really careful about how much emphasis we put on any one of these platforms because they can change at the drop of a hat and they do. And if we are a hundred percent relying on them for our business and then the algorithm changes overnight, our entire business could dry up. So it's important to like sort of diversify the content that you're making. And I think the most important question really is what do you love to make? What do you love to make and how do you love to reach people? Because that's the content that you're going to make. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. Because like, yeah, ranking on SEO is dope. Yeah, like having a lot of followers on IG might be, must be cool. I wouldn't know. But what's more important is being consistent. (laughs) But like, hey, she got the most followers out of all of us on this, uh, (laughs) on this thing. No shade, no shade. But like, what's most important is just showing up consistently. Like all of these things are cool, right? They're like cool tools to use and understand. But like we, at the end of the day, we like forget that there's people on the other side of this, right? And your community are going to be your number one reason that you grow. Like the people, the people that you're talking to, the people that you're helping, the people that you're listening to. And like, So go listen to them and like go talk to them and interact with them. And yes, these platforms give us an opportunity to do that. But like you can also pick up the phone and call them. Like there are so many ways to connect with with actual human beings. And we sometimes forget that that's the point, right? The point is to like be more human and to help more humans on this planet. And so if you just go back to that, Like, I don't think that you can really go wrong and it doesn't matter where the trends go because kind of like when we think about Google of like, well, Google just wants to deliver really good content. Like then as long as you're making really good content, you're probably going to rank pretty highly on Google. Same thing with like your content. As long as you are delivering value and you have a clear intention of who you want to help and how you want to help them, you're going to get a community. You're going to get eyes on your stuff. You're going to get listeners. You're going to get viewers and you're going to get the right people. And that's really, that's really what matters, right? Like quantity. I don't care if I have a hundred thousand people listening to this episode, if only like 1% of them are actually who I'm trying to talk to. I would care more to have a thousand perfect people who exactly needed to listen to this podcast, hear it because that's like, that's more useful and more sustaining to me and more pur- purposeful to me. So I'll get off my soapbox now, but does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Total sense. I wanted to give a shout out, a historical shout out whenever. Oh yeah. Give a historical shout out. I think we're at that moment. You know, every time I can <laughs> shout out a Canadian, I'm going to <laughs> shout out to the Canadian listeners. I'm going to maybe pronounce his name wrong, but I think it's Alan M. Taj. He was, Born in Barbados, but I don't know when he emigrated to Canada. He was recognized as the first person to create a search engine for the Internet. It was created for searching um, in public archives. And he's just a really cool guy. He's only 56. He's really smart. You can learn more about him at the Internet Hall of Fame, which is an amazing site, by the way, if you want to geek out on Internet people and news. But just got to shout him out because the first version of the Internet search engine that he created was called Archie. And it essentially like established a lot of what Google is based on now. Cool. Oh, my God. I love that historical Canadian shout out. (laughs) (laughs) Got to do it. Also Caribbean. Top quality. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Can I give a shout out? Okay, this isn't really a shout out, but earlier you mentioned the funny, quirky pun 
that you would do in your head one, two, and three. And you mentioned Britney Spears and Toxic, oh, yeah. and I just wanted to say as my moral duty that Amen. we should free Britney Spears. <laughs> she should get out of her conservatorship. And she she deserves freedom. She does that. I was actually going to say, would that rank higher now just because culturally that's the conversation? So ultimately, it's not a good long-term strategy, but short-term, it's a decent strategy. Yes, that's exactly it. Yes, because that's probably a lot of people are searching for it. So if you wrote an article right now that was up to date, like you you might get some older articles that have been around for a longer time. Remember, it's kind of like your credit score. If it's been around for longer, then it, it looks better, even if it's a little dusty. But if you were to write something right now about Britney Spears conservatorship, and it was a long SEO article, anywhere from like 1,800 to 2,500 words, and it included tons of links and clips, maybe from the New York Times piece, then it would probably rank pretty highly. Oh, that's kind of like a hack. An SEO hack is like, Jump on the trend, but link it to all of like sources that are like viable and Mm -hmm. then you'll get up there quicker. No? Yeah. 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 And that's a lot of that's that's what people who spend their a lot of time using SEO do. And that's also like how content sites, why they make content so fast, right? Is like Mm -hmm. because they want to jump on trends and they want to get as much traffic to their site as they possibly can. So they'll write like like the Daily Mail is probably like the king of this right (laughs) they'll write like a really trashy piece of content that's like not that good but has like a ton of videos and galleries and images and it's like actually only like you know three paragraphs long but they've spread it out to be super long and it has all the keywords in it but it didn't really like deliver any actual real value because they just want to like jump on the trend so yes seo can be used for good or for evil as with all things i I just want to look at what's on daily mail because i feel like you always got to know what's front page of Daily Mail. And it's, uh, it's always about Meghan Markle, I swear. And it prints Harry. They are so mean to her. They're, They're so, so Like mean. the Daily Mail is actually such trash. Yes, it's like it is. Trash. No, I, I'm not. I, I was being sarcastic. I hope that came through. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. <laughs> Thanks for listening to me wax poetic about SEO. Learned a lot, always. Cool, y'all. Well, thanks for joining me. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> I've got the rest of the week this week. And I'm ooh, excited. Ooh. So, okay. Let me take you back on the way back machine with me. Walk with me. Back in time. Back maybe like a year and a half, two years ago, maybe three years ago, when I started following this person named Bethany C. Myers on Instagram. And I loved them because they had this tattoo all the way down one side of their body and they taught like body neutrality. And I'd never heard of this term body neutrality. And I was like, but I thought I was trying to be body positive because I hate my body. I'm trying to like trick myself into liking it. And they were the first person who ever like truly introduced this topic or concept to me. And the idea that like you don't have to be positive about every part of your body. In fact, it's probably healthier to just be neutral about it. You don't have to constantly be celebrating your body. You can have bad body days and good body days and it's all good. And I just like am obsessed with them. And so that's my wish of the week. (laughs) So let me go back. I feel like that was a horrible story, but my wish of the week is Bethany C. Myers. Bethany is the founder of the Become Project. And let me read their IG bio to you. They're the founder and CEO of the Become Project. They're a body neutral advocate. They are eating disorder recovered and they are queer, poly, married, non-binary, they, them. If that scares you, I'll help it not. And they're married to Nico... Tortorelli or Tortellini? I don't think his name is Tortellini. I think it's Tor Tor Tor. I don't know. I don't know how to say his last name. Their husband Nico is one of the stars of the TV show Younger with Hilary Duff. And yeah, and I love Hilary Duff. Me too. Me too. TBT to the Lizzie McGuire movie. Am I right? Okay. Oh my god. Masterpiece. Yeah, or a Cinderella story. Oh. That was my second favorite movie oh my God. growing up. Chad Michael Murray in that movie was oh my God, so scrumptious. I miss right? him. I feel like he got creepy and weird. Did I make that up? Or I don't know if he got creepy and weird. I did recently see him in a very random Tyler Perry movie, though, and I felt like Betrayed. it was interesting. 
It was really interesting. Unpopular opinion. I'm not a Hillary Duff hater, but I'm not. I mean, watch your tone and watch your mouth, Wallace. I'm pretty. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Hillary Duff neutral. Okay, okay, fine. Well, we can take that. We can take that. (laughs) Okay with that, Wallace. I'm okay with that. (laughs) But I'm. Wake my dreams. Let it fall. Turn turn. Must have. That was a bottle. Yep. Yep. That's Hillary. That was a certified bot. She gave us a bot. She really did. (laughs) Okay, wait. I remember seeing this person's tattoo, Bethany St. Yeah. Myers. It's, it's amazing. amazing. And and they are just yeah. been following them for a while. And when I started following them, they were using she, they pronouns and they've transitioned to using they pronouns. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's just been so beautiful to watch their evolution in real time and, or like what they want to share of their evolution in real time. And for them also to be such an advocate for body neutrality and there I feel like I buried the lead but they teach fitness and so how can we mm-hmm. I I was in the fitness world and space because that was sort of my foray into the wellness space and it's so much of it is so toxic and I just love their perspective mm-hmm. on like being embodied because we have a body how to move and like how to feel good and with exercise because for so many of us we have such a toxic relationship with exercise and hating ourselves and mm-hmm. that being the reason that we work out and it's so complex and nuanced and i think that they just bring so much honesty and authenticity and like messiness to it all which i really appreciate of like not yeah. being all buttoned up and perfect and still practicing and showing your process to others and their work the become project is so inclusive so thoughtful and just and really awesome training to be totally like just look at it from that perspective yeah i want to try yeah. it so i just think that bethany is awesome and totally the witch of the week and the witch of my heart and i love following them and i wish that they had a podcast that i could listen to all the time because i just think they're really smart and cool and i want to be friends with them so bethany if you're out there we should have them <laughs> on the podcast also, i want to say like their their choice of hairstyles oh, is yeah. amazing i just have to say yeah. that because amazing and also they kind of look a little bit like Jim Malone in some pictures which is really I love Jim Malone so that makes yeah me really yeah. yeah they've got a strong eyebrow game which I really appreciate oh, they yeah. started growing out their leg hair it inspired me to start growing out my leg hair like I I'm into it you know like I've, I feel like yeah. I've learned a lot from them and I'm just really grateful that they show up on the internet on the days where I'm like oh the internet sucks I'm like oh but Bethany's on the internet and I really like them <laughs> Do you know what the tattoo actually says? I see because I see the long line along their body, but there's like words in the middle that I can't tell I what they say. Remember, I think that they they talk about the okay. tattoo like every you know once a year or something where they're like everyone asks me about this tattoo and it's like alignment through the whole body, which I really oh, really I love. love. I love yeah, that. it's really powerful. Yeah. I like Mary uh, Alexander. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> Yeah. So that's my witch of the week. And if you're looking for a body neutrality advocate, go follow or just to let a lovely, delightful person, I would say go follow. It also, it makes me think of the episode with Helen Phelan on body neutrality. And when she's like, you know, one thing that helps me is just saying, I have like, <laughs> right. or I have hair. Right. <laughs> Where you just acknowledge it and you don't place a judgment on it. And it's interesting. I think I'm working through that through like meditation with just being a witness to your emotions, not identifying them, whatever. But then with your body, just being like, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> I just I think it's hilarious. And it's kind of fun to add that into your awareness of just like, yeah, that's my I think, body. I think there about that all the time where I'm like. I have skin. I'm <laughs> like, I sound like a fucking serial killer. <laughs> like, what? Oh, boy. I feel like, am I, maybe I'm not involved because <laughs> I'm definitely at a place of, like, not body neutrality. I'm like, I'm a good. 
<laughs> my thighs are getting smaller. They're great. I love it. Like, I'm celebrating that right now, which is okay. I'm in, I'm in that sense. But eventually, we'll get to body neutrality. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand exactly what you're saying, Janelle, because I, too, have those moments where I look in the mirror, and I'm like, damn, bitch. Like, you really are that bitch. But then as I'm getting older, it's like my body is also changing, yes. and I'm recognizing that. That's it. And so that's the part where the body neutrality is just that's coming in even stronger because like having been a younger presenting person for my whole life it's just like then you you get caught up on that (laughs) especially when like yeah yeah especially when like society says things like oh you're aging backwards or you are you sure you're this and it's all that shit that I feel Mm -hmm. like they're trying to make you feel good about but as you get older people try to tell you that you're not old you're like all right all right the clock is ticking so now it's like for me to turn that on its head and not like feel like it's an accomplishment to be its first gene and rather to look at the fact that it's one day that's not going to be here no more. So I really got to accept it. So I'm in the space of not fully accepting it yet and like trying to like <laughs> navigate that middle space because I'm definitely going to be honest, like, not quite accepting it yet, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> But we're on our way. We're on our way. Faith, I'm really with you. I feel in the middle, very much in the middle, because you're you're like, I can't force me to be. It's kind of just like what we talk about wearing the mask. At some point, you just get too exhausted. And it's like at some point, you just get too tired trying to, like, squish your body into something it's not. Pants. Just yeah. gets tiring. <laughs> Pants. The worst. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing about me is, like, if ever there was something about my body that I did not like, I always did the work to, to like make sure that I liked it, which is not healthy because it's conditional love. It's like I only accept myself if my stomach is flat. Mm-hmm. So that's like something to note. But then what about the things you cannot change? You know what I'm saying? Like moles are hereditary in my family. So now I'm starting to get like moles on my cheeks. And at first I was like, Same. oh, they're like freckles. This is kind of cute. And then I'm just like, but it means I'm getting old. <laughs> and it's just like all of the, and it's just like, I can't change my face. You know what I'm saying? I can change my stomach. I can't change my face. So then how do you, that's when body neutrality is just like an even more, it's a challenge, you know, it's like so hard because it's, I have started doing something where if I don't like something about myself, I look in the mirror and I'd be like, I like my ears. I love my ears. I love my ears. Even though I'm like, the fuck, I can't stand my ears, but it's like, <laughs> That's probably not good because that's like a, I, I don't, the I don't intensity know with saying. which you just gazed into the Zoom camera to tell us what that what, what experience is like. You should see me looking at myself in the mirror. It's intense. I felt it. I really <laughs> felt it. Definitely. Yeah, and I feel like that's the complicated oh. thing. It's like, okay, should I try to like these things of myself? Should I just be like, they are. I feel one way sometimes and another way the other time. Like, I don't know, maybe a little bit of both. Uh, it's tough. Yeah. And accepting like, like, right. Like it's everybody's like individual journey. Right. So, you know, I think that depending on kind of what your experiences were with your body and childhood would definitely relay the idea of what it is that you want to be experiencing. Now I think about, you know, I really struggled with accepting my body at all mm. as a child because I felt overweight. I was overweight. And because of that, I've now gotten to a point in my life where, like, the pendulum has swung almost to the opposite side, you know, and I feel like this is a time for me to really celebrate my body and love, you know, all of the things that I know that I can do and, like, experiment with how I can change it myself. And without attaching my value to that, you know, I can play in that. And then, like I said, I think there will come a point beyond that where I'll get to a more neutral space of, like, okay, now this is just my body. I've I've been on the spectrum of all the things, you know, and now I'm just grateful that this body's carried me through this life, Mm -hmm. you know? I relate to that. Like, for after hating my body for so long, and I think when I finally reached my 30s, I was like, oh, I'm fucking hot. And, like, just being like, sweet, that's cool. And sometimes I feel bad because I'm like, oh, is it bad that I, like, think I'm hot? And then I'm like, eh. I'm just going to take this while I, while I got it. It took me like 29 years to get here. I feel like like I can revel in this for like a couple months before, you know, I get to neutrality. Right. Real shit. Real shit. Neutrality will come. It'll be there. It'll be there. (laughs) 
Yeah, you have time for that <laughs> later yeah. in life. <laughs> you know, and if ever you need to celebrate your body or want to get that boost, look at Janelle's Insta story. Oh, yeah. All sis does is stand in front I of the to. camera and, like, show us her body and, like, turn her. And, you, yes. know, you know what? And I was just like, damn, the other day, you know, it's something to be said. Like, what does it mean when you see a black woman that really likes herself and fucks with herself? Mm. And mm. I think it's just inspiring because it's like, how often do we get that? How often do we get to see that? Mm-hmm. So I like looking at your stories, Janelle, where you're just like, I Thank look you. great and I know it. So it's just like, keep doing yeah. that. That's inspiring. Um, I agree. I will keep doing that. Thank mm-hmm. you. I agree. I love it. <laughs> it is it's very inspiring. inspiring. We should all be celebrating all yeah, the bodies. Truly. Truly. Uh, no, I was going to say, Michelle, I constantly think about your story of dropping the towel in front of Ethan and being like, Me you too. better fucking enjoy this. <laughs> I think Me about too. that pretty often. Like, yeah, you're fucking, yeah. fucking right, Michelle. No, I do it a lot to him. Let I him do know. it a lot while he's on Zoom calls. I'm just like, look how hot I am. And he's like, I'm on a call. I'm on a call. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You're Respect. like, appreciate the body but, now. Like, I'm appreciating it. You better fucking appreciate Like, you know. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. God damn it. <laughs> Appreciate how confident I am. It took me a really long time to get here. So like, yes, I want you to like see that too. Yeah. It's true. And I think there's like a difference between accepting and reveling in your body and like being proud of your body because you've done something to it. Like you're thin or like yeah. some you have yeah. a six pack because you worked out, which like no shade to that if that's what you're working on. But mm-hmm. like, when you accept your body, it gives other people a permission to accept themselves too. And like yes. when just yes. like Janelle's stories, like Janelle, you celebrating yourself opens up the opportunity and space for other people to celebrate themselves too. And that's really fucking cool. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think we should just be taking more naked pictures. That's all. Like, I think that we yes. should just be taking yes. more. <laughs> That's we through should... our photo shoot news. <laughs> group, group chat. Yeah. <laughs> Company photo well, shoot. This doesn't really take the, it takes the it. left turn. <laughs> all of a sudden, it's just boobs all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> boobs and ass. Be boobs and ass. It. Honestly, why are nipples a uh, weird thing? I don't, I feel like that is like so hey, dated. Are they still banned on Instagram? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. I mean. Nipples aren't even erotic. They're yeah. weird. You know, like, yeah, if you just think about them, they're well, weird. Like, stop making it weird, Mark Zuckerberg. Like, you perv, you yeah. know, like, yeah. God. Well, I think it, it's interesting because we are this is a whole other potential topic. So I won't go on a tangent, but we are also in the age of like digital dysmorphia with all of these mm. filters and you know, people are getting plastic surgery based on filters. And I think it's going to be interesting to see where we go with body neutrality. Because even in this conversation, I'm like, hmm, that's not like an active practice that I have. But I wonder with the rise of digital dysmorphia in general, if we're going to also see a rise in body neutrality as being very similar to Mm. mindfulness. It's a practice that is more commonplace and more people are talking about it consistently. I think it'll have to be because of what's happening right now. I think we're seeing how it's affecting like the younger generations and then like being getting caught up in the filters and not necessarily having a real grasp on what it is to just look like a real person. But I, I mean, I hadn't thought about that, but it feels like that will absolutely be necessary in order to counteract that. Cause you're, you're, you're going to have, I feel like yeah. potentially generations of people growing up so fucked in their own like self identity and like what, it, again, it is to like be to be beautiful and to accept yourself as you are. Like, yeah, I, that's a very real thing. It's a very real. Those filters are a little out of control. I can't yeah, lie. But like, <laughs> uh, have you guys watched the Britney Spears documentary yet? No, yeah, not yet. So but good. I keep hearing so many it's things. So good. Me too. It's, it's great. I can't wait to I wish finish it. Okay, I'm gonna watch it. Yeah, it was really good. I heard it's, it's devastating. devastating. Yeah, but it's so sad. Watching oh, it, like you know, Britney Spears. We're all around the same age. Like. She came up when we were in middle school and, like, into high school and college. And I remember, like, so many of the pictures that they showed. I remember seeing those pictures in tabloids or, like, on Perez Hilton or whatever. And, like, looking at her body and comparing, like, my body to her body or, you know, so many celebrities at that time. And, like, 
now that I look back, I'm like, oh, she was just a child, <laughs> you know, or like whatever. Yeah, but I, I wonder, like, the media's perception of what was beautiful was so narrow at that point in time. It wasn't even that long ago. And it's definitely impacted us. And to your point around like digital body dysmorphia, I wonder how that's going to change and evolve. But I also feel like, I don't know, like what I see on TikTok and Instagram, like Bethany to circle all the way back, like has definitely freed me up from like feeling so horrible about parts of myself, you know, of like, oh, everyone has cellulite or like everyone has like a uterus. So it's like okay to not have a totally flat yeah. stomach, because if you did, like, where the fuck would your organs go? Like, and that is really yeah. helpful, because like, I don't know, you can feel so alone, and it's just nice to see behind. I don't know, that's a double edged sword, as are all things yeah. on the internet. Yeah, which I, no, but I think it's interesting because both are rising at the same mm-hmm. time, in a way. So I'm I'm very happy that this was your witch of the week. So I'm a yeah. fan. I'm going to check out their classes. Yeah. Maybe we can all try class together. That would be fun. So that's the Witch of the Week. Bethany C. Myers, The Become Project. Bethany, if you're out there, call us. We'd love to talk to you. Okay, y'all. That's all I have. Anything else? Well, since we're in the age of Aquarius, I also think that there's going to be new thought around, like, body dysmorphia or internet. What is it called? Yeah. Digital dysmorphia. Digital dysmorphia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I feel like, yeah, new schools of thought are coming up in so many areas, especially because we're still in a pandemic where people are, like, really reassessing a lot of things still. So, yeah, 100%. There's something that I'm always scared to say because I don't want to oh ever God, we say can it. Well, I don't want to say I don't want to offend anybody or seem disrespectful at all, but I actually just heard one person say this yesterday and I never heard anybody else besides me say this and I really am not joking when I say this people like laugh when I whenever I brought this up but I don't know do you do you guys ever think like do you think that there's a real thing as such as like reverse body dysmorphia like where you think you're hotter than you actually like are? where yeah or like you think you're smaller than you actually are like you yeah. have it you do you still have a warped image like look of your body yeah it's just sure. in the opposite yeah. direction okay yeah, I always feel nervous bringing that up to people because I don't want to, again, ever offend people. And it, I, to some people, it always seems like a joke because it's like, oh, you think you're skinny, but you're like not really skinny. But I, I've always c- considered that, that like that could be a real thing. And I, at one point I thought I, I actually dealt with I'm not even like at one point I thought I actually dealt with that. I don't think I do deal with that. But it made me realize that, that people could actually really be out there dealing with that and then I heard somebody talk about it yesterday and was like oh maybe it is a real thing and I shouldn't be afraid to bring it up I think there's always opposites right for I, I don't know it's, I, I mean it's that. just like your personality like you might think that you're one way and then like you get you're like oh I'm in the world I'm like a, I'm a generous person and then you pull 10 people and they're like actually mm, opposite and you're like what wait what I thought I was this way because like we're our only barometer of truth Mm. right Mm. you know what i mean like not to get super existential but like everything is your perception so Mm -hmm. you can perceive the complete opposite of what is true to somebody else from the same situation Mm. whether that's the size of Mm. your waist or your personality or uh, or the health of a nation like my Mm. perception might be completely different than another's and we're experiencing the same thing big facts Big fact. Yeah, it brings it on pretty yeah. easily. Being a human there. is wild. Wild. It is a wild ride. It's a journey. It's amazing. I love it. It's actually really fucking incredible, but it's wild. <laughs> oh, I feel like that's a good that's a good note to end on. What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah agree. Okay, great. Thanks for listening to the Twelfth House podcast. We love in being in your ear holes. Thanks for letting us be here now and thanks for listening. And if you like this podcast, share it with your friends and rate, review and subscribe. It really means a lot to us when you write a review, we read them, we cry over them, we celebrate them. So thank you. And we love hearing from you. So if you like this, share it on your feed or on your IG and tag us and let's DM. Let's be internet friends. Okay. Anything you guys want to add? (laughs) Nah, peace out. Y'all cool. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye.